Okay. So far in this course, uh, this is economics for business. If anybody's still in the wrong lecture, leave now or forever hold your peace. EC4004, EC4913, economics for business. Anybody still in the wrong place? Okay. Uh, right, so we have seen several things in the last two weeks. Uh, we've seen, uh, first off, households, the, the microeconomic description of households. We've seen a couple of ways to describe households. First is utility maximizers. You saw that last semester. Utility max. Maximizer. The idea that you have some budget constraints, x1 and x2, you maximize your utility, your utility function of x1 and x2, subject to this thing. The budget constraint is p1, x1 plus p2, x2 is less than or equal to m. The idea of this is that satisfying some basic assumptions about how people behave, they prefer more to less, blah, 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 you'll basically get quite a nice uh, picture of human behavior. And the idea is that you'll maximize this utility. I'll draw that as if I actually wanted you to take it down. So, u of x1, x2, this is your utility function represented by your difference curve. And this thing here is the utility maximization of this project constraint p1, x1, plus p2, x2, which is left equal to m. That's the first description of households that you saw. <coughs> the second description was the household as satisficing. Satisficing, or bounded rationality. Okay, the idea that you hold rules, simple rules, in your head, that you live by. The third, you, the third uh, version you saw was choice under uncertainty. Choice under uncertainty. And then we saw that la this day last week, I think. And just to give you a laugh, that day, after spending an hour ranting at you about breaking iPhones, guess what I did? <laughs> I haven't got that on me, I've forgotten in my office. The back is smashed to bits. I rang up the insurance company and they went, oh, it's you again. They went, politely, go fuck yourself. Buy yourself a new phone. And I was like, oh no, I have to buy a new phone. Disaster. <coughs> so, luckily enough, it came out. A new one came out recently. So I can indulge my particular form of obsession. <laughs> the next thing we saw. Sorry. What's the name of the insurance company? Oh, uh, it's just the, uh, the O2 insurance company. Yeah. The, uh, they only let you break three phones in one year. The, uh, and I've done it. The, um, <laughs> The next thing we saw were firms. So you saw two versions of firms. The first was the profit maximizing, <coughs> profit max firm. Again, simple idea. You've got a choice between capital and between labor. And what the firm does is it figures out its, its highest isoquant, isoquant, Q-U-A-N-T. Uh, based on its own technological constraint, which is just its production function, f of l and k. And again, you can see that these two pictures are, are, are roughly the same. And the reason that they're roughly the same is because the mathematics behind it is identical. Okay? The mathematics behind it is identical. The second story you saw was the firm as growth maximizer. Growth maximizer. This is the last thing last week. And the idea was that firms are finance constrained. We'll be coming back to that a lot in the, in the next few weeks. Finance constrained firms. The idea is quite simple. With, when a firm can borrow more, it does, and it expands rapidly, but that eats into its retained earnings and makes it more vulnerable to crash. Okay? And so this idea of firms maximizing their growth uh, you had these two objects. The first was the expansion frontier. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the finance frontier. <coughs> finance frontier, and then you had the expansion frontier, which looked a bit like this. So you had two points here. This is growth. This is investment. You had this point here, G of K, 
this one here, G, G. And you can see that the finance constraint firm gave lower investment but higher growth, and here you've got the highest amount of growth. Okay. So a firm that's a growth maximizer, as opposed to a profit maximizer, will have a different set of characteristics. So you've already seen the objective of this course is to extend and deepen your knowledge of economics. This time last year you had two versions of what households and firms do. This and this. Now you have five ways to describe them. Okay? And we're already in, we're only in week three. So that's what I want you to learn today. And there, and that's the examples. That's, that's what's come up on the exam. So you should turn up a little bit earlier. You'll uh, learn something. So today, today we're moving on to banks. What I want you to learn today, banks are balance sheets and liquidity engines. Okay? <coughs> Essentially, all a bank does is take a deposit from you at an interest rate, which we'll call ID, and lend at an interest rate II, such that ID is greater than II. Would everybody please write that down? That's basically what a bank is. It's a liquidity engine, and all it does is take deposits at 3% and lend at 6%. And it makes money in the interim. That's it. There's literally nothing else to do with banking. You, if you understand this, if you understand this, you understand all of banking. The problem is bankers get a bit full of themselves, a bit ahead of themselves. They start thinking that they're more important than they are, and then things blow up on them. And it turns out that this is not a new feature, not a feature of the Irish economy, not a feature of any economy. It's just been happening. It's, it's a feature of finance-constrained capitalism. It's been happening for at least 800 years. And every 20 years or so, we forget about that, and it blows up in our faces. Banks are balance sheets and liquidity engines. I'll explain what a liquidity engine is in a minute. But essentially, banking takes place on what's called the 363 rule. Take deposits at 3%, lend at 6%, hit the golf course at 3 p.m. That's it. It is literally that simple. There's nothing more to it. You might go, well, hang on a minute, Stephen, now, just a second. I have an idea. There are other things that this company does. And I'll say, well, yeah, there are, there are, there are. But, um, it all boils down to this. So please understand this and you're groovy. So here's where we are in our microeconomic description of the, the part of, of this part of the course. Okay, so they're liquidity engines. Uh, all right, okay. I get that, Stephen, but what are they? Well, okay, there are different types of banks. That's the first thing you should understand. There's no such thing as the bank. There are different types of banks. They do different things. Banking evolves from goldsmiths. In the 14th and 15th centuries, most people held their wealth in gold. The issue, the issue was, where do you store your gold? If you, if you keep your gold in a place where, where bigger people with bigger knives can stab you and take it off you, you're not going to have your gold for very long. So what people did was, they started leaving it with goldsmiths. Why? Goldsmiths had the biggest and best protected safes. Why? Because they're goldsmiths and they have a lot of gold. So what happened was the guys used to just write notes to each other saying, please pay Bob such and such an amount from my account in the goldsmith, in the goldsmith's uh, uh, vault. And then Bob would use that note for something else because it was worth something. And that's where paper money uh, uh, originates from. So commercial banks basically come from that. They come from the notion of goldsmiths holding money. So they hold a bit of money or something of value and money is derived from that piece of value. Okay? That's called specie currency. Specie. S-P-C-I-E. Specie. The reason it's called specie is because it's based on the gold that's underpinning the value of this stuff. These days there is no specie currency. It's called a fiat currency. F-I-A-T. Fiat currency. And it's just currency because someone says it is. Someone says it is. Do you know who that someone is? Pardon? But, but I mean, it's literally a someone. <coughs> literally, it's, it's a person. Do you know who it is in Ireland? Well, his name is probably on your money. Nope. It's, it, how many of you have money in your pocket? 
You're rocking around with this guy. If you don't have this man's signature on your, if you don't have this man's signature on your piece of paper, it's not money. Look in your wallets. Look in your wallets. You'll see there's a sort of a squiggle. There's a squiggle. Get out, get, get out your money. If you've got money, get it out. Look at it. Look at your money. There's a little blue squiggle just there. What does it say? Who, Mr. Burns. <laughs> no, it's not Mr. Burns. Who is it? Maybe can I, can I do this? No, I can't. I was going to switch on the, oh yeah, okay. So, uh, can you all see that? Shift. Can you all see who's that? M. Draghi. You think his name is going to be on billions of euros worth of notes? You think he would have made it legible, but no. That's Mario. Super Mario, if you don't have his name on this piece of paper, it is not money. It is this. Less snotty, not to be fair, but it's just this. What's the difference between this and this? Apart from the snot? Pardon? It has value. What's value? It's got no value. It's a piece of paper. Should I just tear it up like? Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. I'm not joking. Come on, what is it? What's the difference? Pardon? I could buy gold, yeah. I could totally buy gold. I could buy other things too. Yeah. Very good. It's generally accepted as a medium of exchange. So if I go to the spa shop to buy a roll and I say, hello, young man, please present, please give me a ham roll. He would say, yes, thank you, sir. And he will give me change. If I turn up and say, hello, young man, please give me a roll. He will go... Please cart this idiot away, right? <laughs> the difference is one piece of, but, but there is no effective difference between the two pieces of paper, all right? So there is something about money, something fundamental. And the fundamental thing about money is, one, it's used as a medium of exchange. Everyone write that down. Used as a medium of exchange. Two, it's used as a store of value. It's used as a store of value. Medium of exchange. Store of value. And the third one is a unit of account. You hold you, the account in your, in your, on your bank account. It's in, not denominated in euros or yen or whatever. Okay? So that's what money does. There are different types. Number one, unit of account. Number two, medium of exchange. Number three, store of value. Obviously, the value changes over time. So 10 euros, when I was a kid, would have bought you nothing. Why? Because it didn't exist. 10 <laughs> groats when I was a kid. 10, 10 pounds, 10 Irish pounds would have bought you a lot more, a lot more, actually, than 10 euros would buy you now. So the store of value is changing over time. Okay? It'll buy you a lot less. Your purchasing power is being eroded. But anyway, that's what banks do. Banks receive deposits and make loans for stuff. Commercial banks. What's an example of a commercial bank? AIB. Is, it a, is AIB a commercial bank? We kind of own AIB, don't we? Are we shareholders in AIB? Yeah. Are they still a commercial bank? Or are they like the Central Bank of Ireland? Do they, what's, 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 what's the fundamental difference between a commercial bank and a central bank? The commercial bank tries to make money on that interest rate spread. That's what it really does, okay? It tries to make the difference between I, uh, ID and IS, okay? The central bank 
Its job is to issue currency and maintain stability. Their, their roles could not be more different. Okay? One is gamekeeper, the other is the fox, basically. Basically. So it's a, there's a big difference between central banks, which issue currency and maintain stability, and commercial banks, which try to rip everybody off. And then finally, there are investment banks. Now, investment banks, investment banks are very strange entities. They essentially, they essentially do everything that commercial banks don't. There's finally a fourth type of bank, which, which uh, just for a joke, I haven't written down. They're called shadow banks. Shadow banks. And what shadow banks are really, shadow banks represent unregulated capital. They, rank, they, rev, they, they, rev, they <coughs> probably represent 2 trillion euros worth, or dollars worth of unregulated capital. Regular banks like AIB are regulated by the central bank and by the European <coughs> Central Bank. Shadow banks are not regulated by these guys. They don't have underlying assets. As a matter of fact, they will trade almost exclusively in derivatives and other funky products. And so shadow banks represent an enormous existential threat to the financial system. But nobody can cope with them because they're very difficult to see. Why are they very difficult to see? Because they're shadow banks. They're, they're off-balance sheet creations. OK. And there, a day will come quite soon when, balance, when ba the balance sheets of shadow banks blow up. And uh, then we probably won't know what hit us. So I said banks generate liquidity. What do I mean when I say they generate liquidity? They literally create liquidity by accepting short-term deposits. I am giving you my, my salary this month. Here is my salary. You know, there you go. They accept short-term deposits. They make short-term but effectively long-term business loans. So I give you, I give my money to the bank, the bank gives it to someone else. <coughs> this is the fundamental fallacy of banking. The fundamental fallacy of banking is that they pretend that the money is sitting on the bank's balance sheet, but it's not. It's off somewhere, hopefully, making it money. Now, when the bank lends out the loan, the bank is taking the risk. That is why the loan is the liability. Yeah? The bank is taking the risk. The risk is that they don't get the loan back. Huge risk, monumental risk, even if it's just a car loan for 10 grand. It's a really big risk. Okay? And the bank has built in the probability of default of most, most uh, uh, of these products into the price of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the interest. So what they're doing is they're covering the couple of people who default with everybody else. So they're, they're, uh, ideally, in normal circumstances, banks never lose money. In fact, even in 2009, when things were absolutely at their worst, AIB managed to bank a billion euros in profit just from its domestic transactions. So these are not unprofitable uh, industries. Now, the banks have to monitor the loans very carefully. If you miss a payment on your loan, the bank will send you a letter. And it will be something kind of like, hey, how's it going? Listen, I just saw that you might have missed your loan. Listen, don't worry if you've already sent it in. It's totally cool. Whatever. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Cheers. If you missed the second payment, they're like, hello. Where's my money? If you miss the third payment, you've got people calling you up. If you continue to miss payments, they're going to call you every single day in certain circumstances. And it can be very, very stressful. And so banks monitor these loans and call them in. Now, they're supposed to specialize in intimate knowledge of businesses. They're supposed to know them. OK? They're supposed to <laughs> right. So they're supposed to know these things. but. Um, the truth about it is that's not the case anymore. The truth about it is your bank manager has no idea about you. Hands up with bank loans. Some kind of a class of a loan who's ever had one. No one? Hands way up. Less than 10% of the class have had loans. Like no one here has had a loan. Not one person. Interesting. Okay. Right. Ah, that's, yes, of course. You're the children of the boom. I forgot. Or the bust, brother. Yeah, you, do, you, you can't afford loans. Okay, that's interesting. It looks to be you. So, <clears throat> or maybe it doesn't, because now you don't have to pay them back. Because I'm going to show you a scary chart in a second. How do we, how do we know that banks are dangerous? They, because they create money, and they cause credit booms. 
Here is the increase in the loan books of Irish banks from 2001 all the way up to 2008. What you're looking at here, that blue line is Anglo-Irish Bank. And when you see the blue line and it's, at, you know, here, here, this means, this means that the loan book from 2003 to 2004 increased by 40%. The loan book itself, not like commercial loans, the whole thing. The loan book is... Uh, I owe, uh, I've given a loan to you, and 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 a loan to you. That's the loan book. And what it means is, effectively, I've given a loan to everybody here in, in 2004, and everybody here in 2005. Most of the time, banks' loan books increase by 3, 4, 5, 6%. These guys increase by 40% a year, and nobody thought anything was wrong. Well, you can see here... This is probably why so few of the younger members of the, of the uh, class have a loan. It's because it's very expensive to get, and you'd probably need to be rich just to afford one, essentially. Because you can see that these banks, after 2008, essentially don't lend out any more money. Their banks, their, their loan books never grow. This is the construction bubble. See, notice two things. First, Anglo-Irish Bank is... is, is, is way ahead, way ahead of everybody else. But notice two other things. AIB rockets in, absolutely rockets into the field, and with Bank of Ireland, a very slow second, which explains in large part why AIB is almost totally nationalized and why Bank of Ireland is, has escaped, essentially. They didn't lend out the really, really, really dodgy loans in the same scale that Anglo and AIB did. Okay. So, banks only keep a fraction of their deposits on reserve. A fraction. This is called the reserve requirement ratio. <coughs> Please write this down. Lending creates money. Very important. Lending creates money. You are creating money by lending people. Lending money to people. But it's only, it's only half the story. You have created money, but it's only a balance sheet creation. It's only on your balance sheet that this thing exists until it's paid back. The money isn't real until it comes back. Then it becomes real. So if you lend out the money, you're taking a gamble. That the person is going to actually pay you back. And when they do, you are a genius. You are a genius. You are the greatest genius in the history of the world. Do you know why? You just made money for doing absolutely nothing. Nothing has happened. You have done nothing. And you're making billions of euros. It is a great job once it works. Very few people seem to remember that Anglo-Irish Bank was voted the best bank in the world in 2005. The best bank in the world. That's amazing. And now it's like, well, Anglo, it was always going to blow up. Same people. Please write this down. Bank lending is unstable. It is unstable. It blows up in your face. Why does it blow up in your face? Because if you keep lending to riskier and riskier and risky people at higher and higher and higher and higher amounts, eventually someone's going to say, can't pay you back, buddy, and you're screwed. <coughs> and then you're not a genius. Then you're a fraud. Or you turn into a hate figure. <coughs> which is exactly what has happened to some of the bankers in Ireland. You probably can't hear the name Sean Fitzpatrick without feeling some kind of vestigial sort of annoyance. But it wasn't always this way. Um, we have remarkably short memories. And one of the things I'd like you to learn in this class is have a slightly longer memory. Uh, pretty soon you'll all be out of college and you'll all be working, hopefully, and it'll come time to get married and sit, settle down and have kids and all that. Although I, we've already ascertained that most of the women here aren't having kids. But some of you will have kids. The four people of the 300 here that will have kids. And you'll decide, will we, will we buy a house? And hopefully, hopefully you won't remember me, but you'll certainly remember the notion that, well, maybe this thing might be overvalued. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see if that actually sticks. Maybe you won't buy the house. So let's see what happens. Here's what happens. Number one with a bullet. We have a series of assets on the left-hand side, series of liabilities on the right-hand side. In a, at period one, there's 100 euros in, in, in reserves and 900 in loans. And what happens is 
every period it lends out the rest. Okay? So in period two, it has 90 in reserves and 810 in loans. In period three, it's got 81 in, in reserves uh, and 729 in loans. So it just keep, keeps lending out uh, and keeps getting back. And you can see that what's happening to its liabilities, it's dropping over time because the loans are getting paid back. No problem. Loans are getting paid back. 1,000, 900, 810, it's all good. When you stack these things, what you see is that from round one all the way up to round n, where n can be a very large number, you, the change in money is 1,000, 900, 810, 729. You end up with 10,000. You started with 1,000 euros worth of money, and you end with 10,000 euros. And why is this? Why is this? Why is this? This is called fractional reserve creation. Fractional reserve creation. It's incredibly important. It's the fundamental feature of the modern capitalist system, and it is essentially a lie. It's a lie at the very heart of the capitalistic system. Because the lie is, if you hand 3,000 euros or 5,000 euros to the bank, that that 5,000 euros is sitting there waiting for you to take it. If you all went to the bank right now, you all went right now, you wouldn't be able to take it out. The money wouldn't be there. Your money is not there. It's not physically sitting in the bank. You, it might look like it is, but it's not. The bank has physically lent that on. Now, I would like you all to have a think about this. There's a multiplier. The extent to which money can be created through the traditional fractional reserve system is called the money multiplier. And it's a very simple process to understand. Would everybody please write down this little formula here? Multiplier equals 1 plus C divided by R plus C. Would everybody write that one down for me? The basic problem is... The basic problem is if you have some reserve requirement R, and R could be 2%, R could be 10%, R could be 98%, whatever, okay? Then C, C here would be a measure of money escaping the banking system. Now, how can money escape the banking system? I don't have the text message thing here, so you just a shout out. How can money escape the banking system? Yep. When you went like that, I thought you were out. Okay. How can money escape the banking system? <coughs> it escapes because I move it abroad. I say, well, here you go. Uh, I buy a house in Mallorca. Or I send money to my brother in England or something. Yeah? That's how it happens. But let's, 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 let's see equals to zero. So there's no money escaping the system. In this case, in this case, the money multiplier, let's just say... Let's just say that you have to keep 20% of your reserves. If you have to keep 20% of, of the bank's reserves on the books, you can only lend out 80%. In this case, in this case, the multiplier is 5. So if you have 100 million euros in the bank, then you can, buy, just by lending it out and getting it all back, you can end up with a 500 million euro prize. So this is very nice. <coughs> Very nice money if you can get it. You haven't robbed anybody. In fact, you've helped the economy grow. You haven't, you haven't ripped anybody off. You haven't hurt anybody. But you've made five times more money than there was before. This is great. You're a genius. Happy days. Have a, have a Mercedes. Have a bonus. You're a genius. So, banks create new money on the spot by, by monetizing a promissory note. You would have heard of this word promissory note before. It's come up in the context of Irish macroeconomic finance. But the <coughs> promissory note, effectively, what the promissory note is, a promise to pay. It says, if you give me 10 grand today, I will give you 12 grand back. So what you're doing is, you're taking that 12,000 piece of paper, and you're turning it into money. So what's the difference between you and Mario Draghi. There is no difference. You are literally creating money. Only Mario gets his name on it. It's the only difference. You, 
you create money on the spot by monetizing this promissory note. Okay? Now note, for, note, note first of all, and, and for, for, this, for the purposes of the rest of the lecture, that for the, for the vast majority of the history of modern banking, there was no such thing as a central bank. Central banks really only came into existence after the end of the Great Depression. At the end of the day, you need what's called a Federal Reserve Bank. You need a Reserve Bank to regulate this stuff because it is unstable. Well, how is it unstable? There's a risk of bank runs. You can't liquidate a bank's loan quickly. You can't say, hey, listen, I gave you that money for that factory. Any chance you could sell off the bricks? I need the money back now. It's not going to work. You can't liquidate the loan quickly. Short-term depositors almost always lack information about the quality of the bank's loans. It's not, it's, it's not the case that you're going, oh, I don't think I'll bank with Bank of Ireland. They look really dodgy to me. Yeah? Very few people think that. Most people bank with Bank of Ireland because that's what their father did. In fact, in fact, you're actually far more likely to divorce someone than to break up with your bank, even today. It's much, much more likely that you'll divorce somebody. But very few. But what's really interesting, uh, the comment, comment here, uh, uh, very good question. If you look at the recent Ulster Bank, absolute fiasco, some people did change. That's absolutely true. But you would have expected 50% of them to leave, and they didn't. If you were cut off from your electricity for two months, you wouldn't be with ESB today, would you? You'd be like, no, fuck them, good luck. But actually, very few people have actually left Ulster Bank. They go, these people are awful, but they gave me 20 quid. Okay. 25, even better. And they did give you money if you went into the bank. Even if you didn't have an account. <laughs> so I rock in and go, I didn't get paid. I didn't get paid because none of the UL, I'm a UL employee, obviously. We didn't get paid for two days or something. So I could actually hear the direct debit sort of pinging off my bank account, you know. So, uh, so if I rocked at the bank, the bank of, to Ulster Bank and said, give me money. Why? Oh, okay, right. So you have to have an account. Really? Woohoo! How good for them. So, Bank of our, Bank, Ulster Bank have actually done quite a quite a nice damage limitation exercise, haven't they? Oh, very good for yes. That's very interesting. They've done a, a nice damage limitation thing. They've, they've gone here is money. This will make you happy. Here, have money. And twenty five quid. It's not small. It's not large either, really. I suppose. So now, uh, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. So, here's the story. What's the most middle class area in Limerick? You know the one that people go, well, I'm from blah, blah, blah. You go, ooh, he must have money. What's that one? Mallorca? What? What? No. Well, what's, what's the most middle class one? What's it called? Like if you come from people, there, people go, ooh, daddy must be a doctor or something. Anacotti? Castle Troy? Pardon? <laughs> Yeah, it's a wealthy area. Imagine the following scenario. There's a cattle truck driving through Castle Troy, through one of the nice estates there. You know, it's very nice. Paul O'Connell lives there. It's all very, ooh, it's cool. And the cattle truck breaks down. And as it breaks down, it's there for like five minutes, when the residents of Castle Troy burst out of their doors, brandishing knives, butcher's knives. They disable the driver, jump across the barrier, and begin slaughtering the cows. Slaughtering them. They butcher the cows there and then, tear them to pieces, and carry the meat away, raw, back to their houses. That didn't happen in Castle Troy. But it did happen in Argentina in 2001. In 2001, the Argentinian version of Castle Troy uh, saw this happen. And what happened was quite simple. There was a bank run after a collapse, and the bank run caused everybody to be unable to access their funds for a long period of time. And so you had stockbrokers crawling over trash bins looking for food. You had an absolute breakdown in society, and you had these things. 
So when you're looking at your case studies, you'll see the case study of Argentina very soon. When you look at the case study of Argentina, please make sure to understand that you assume banks just work. You just assume they work. It's like your plumbing. You don't think about your plumbing until it's broken. Yeah? But I'm telling you, when these things don't work, exactly as in the Ulster Bank case, the system collapses. And all, all normal society collapses with it. So, in 1988, the Basel Accord decided to regulate banks. They said, you will absolutely not be allowed to lend out the way you've been lending out in the past. Okay? And they had capital requirements, specific capital requirements. And it said, you've got to keep 8%. It was called the Tier 1 capital requirement. 8% of your capital must be on the books. And they said, this will regulate banks. This will keep them calm. This will stop them from blowing up. This was 1988. Clearly, it didn't work. It was about as useful as a chocolate kettle. Okay? It didn't work. Here's the difference between 1999 and 2008 in terms of the different deposits of banks in Ireland. No need to look, no need to take this down, just notice the numbers in red. Foreign bank deposits went up 29%. Irish bank deposits went up 17%. Customer deposits went up 22%. Bonds went up 8%. And other liabilities went up 11 What are you seeing? What are you seeing? What is this table telling you? telling you there's been a massive inflow of foreign capital. A massive inflow of foreign capital. What happened was the Irish banks had lent out almost 100% of their deposits and people still wanted loans. People still wanted loans. So what did they do? They borrowed the money abroad. They said, hey, Deutsche Bank, hey, Goldman Sachs, give me the money and I'll lend it to some Egypt, Nanakati or something, who will buy this house off me. He wants loan finance for the house. And so there was bridging finance. The banks, crucially, and everybody please write this down, the banks were borrowing foreign, borrowing short foreign, lending domestic long. Borrowing short foreign, lending domestic long. Now this is hugely important. It's hugely important because it's a bit like Short foreign domestic loan. Short foreign means I borrow, obviously from abroad, but I borrow at three months or six months. I borrow for three months. Give me a hundred grand now, I'll give it back to you in three months. Time. Lending long means you, you borrow the money off me today if I'm the bank. You borrow it for 25 years. I don't get the money back for 25 years. That's long. Okay? That's really long. There are some people who took out their mortgages in 2006 won't have them paid off till 2049. You know? Like when you think about this sort of stuff, 2050, in certain cases. So, bit of a disaster. Why? In 2007, the subprime crisis erupts. It causes the, banks of the, it causes the banks of the world to shut down. They stop lending to one another. The tide goes out. And everybody realizes who is wearing no underpants in the water and at the Irish banks. They're absolutely naked. They cannot cover any of their liabilities and so they collapse. And what do we do? We sweep in and guarantee the assets of the liabilities of the entire banking sector in what is easily the stupidest move that any Irish person has ever made. After Basel, after the complete collapse of the financial system or the near complete collapse of the financial system, the Basel III requirements came up. They've increased. These don't, have to, these, these don't take, in, take force till 2020. But these, these Basel III, III capital requirements are already biting, basically. Essentially, what's happening is banks are being required to hold more money on their books to stop them from being so explosively risky. In so doing, they're not lending out anymore. But because they're already choked up with bad loans, they're not going to give any more out anyway. So this is a big problem, and that's where we are right now. Now, in reality, in reality, you must understand the following premise. The following premise is very, very important. Okay? The largest component of the money supply is just the amount of money in circulation. Literally, this stuff. Okay? Literally, what you've got in your banks. 
Okay? It's what you've got. That money supply is called M2. Okay? Somebody get that girl a glass of water or something. Somebody got a bottle of water. Poor girl. Now she's embarrassed as well as nearly dying. Come on. Somebody give her a bottle of water. Jesus, I'm not kidding. She's like this. <laughs> she's a poor woman. All right. <laughs> I've made it worse, haven't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> she's like... <laughs> I'll stop now. <laughs> yes, hoodies will make it all better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Seriously, somebody pass the girl over a glass of water. All right. Okay. Um, oh, wait. I've got a glass of water. Here. I've got a glass of water. She's like, I'm not drinking it. <laughs> Out of sheer embarrassment. All right. If you want it, it's down here, tantalizingly liquidy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Do, 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 do. You know what? No, it's all for me. <laughs> Back on track, Stephen. Come on, stop. Okay, so uh, money and banking in reality. What the f anyway, money and banking in reality. The largest component of the money supply is the amount of money that you've got in your bank, right? Now, to understand how it influences the supply of money... We need to examine the following four linkages. Now people are just copying going, eh, eh, eh. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> people are listening to this recording going, what is he doing? Yep. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, right. Four things. The, the central bank, which is like the ECB, the Fed, the Bank of Japan, whatever. The private banking system, Bank of Ireland, AIB, all of that. Depositors and borrowers. Depositors are you. Borrowers are you. You are a depositor. You put the money in the bank. You are a borrower. You take the money out of the bank. It's the same people. Just at different points in their, in their lives. Now, the interaction between these four groups has various effects. There are different types of money. Loads of different types of money. Okay? And we count them in different ways. Normally, we use M2 which is the sum of the currency in circulation, traveler's checks, demand deposits, other checkable deposits, savings, and time deposit, less than 100,000. There's loads of different ways to measure this, but this is what we term the money supply. So would everybody please write down M2 equals money supply in your, in your minds. M2 basically is the money supply. Okay. M2 is the money supply. Very important. So when you're looking at this stuff, look at the amount of money that's being printed. A lot of you will be thinking, oh, is QE3 M2? Is the amount of money that Brent Bernanke's printing off, is that M2? And the answer is no, it's not. And the answer is no, it's not. Okay. I'll tell you what QE2 is on whenever we have our next lecture. It will be at some point in the future. So, well, how did this start? National accounting. Well, macroeconomics is based on the study of flow of funds accounting uh, in the 1950s. Basically, Sir Richard Stone, Nobel laureate in economics, came up with the notion that every corresponding flow should go somewhere and come from somewhere. Okay? And what we do now, when we estimate GDP or GNP or any of these things, we're using what is called the system of national accounts, which was revised in 1993 and 1995. Um, and at the end of the day, that is what we use to do all our counting. This is the amount of M3 in circulation in the Eurozone for 99, 2003 to 2012. It looks a bit like somebody having a heart attack, doesn't it? It looks a lot like that. Beep, boop, 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 uh, dead. Basically, that, that's what this is, right? That's what this is. Eurozone M3 currency in circulation. You can see that there's a huge drop in, huge drop in the currency in circulation here. This is the September the 11th crack, uh, uh, um, attack. Okay. Once this happens... Actually, September the 11th is kind of the reason for the Irish property crash, believe it or not. Um, and this is why. The moment that September the 11th happens, basically, all of the central bankers in the world decide to print off a load of money. And what they do is, they keep this artificially high. They give all this money to the banks, and they say, keep going. 
and they basically reduced this very slowly over time. You can see this is quite literally the Lehman Brothers event. This is it. This is the Lehman Brothers event. And up to this point, basically, the system is uh, uh, in somewhat of a crisis. So, what is a central bank? It is the big bank. The central financial authority. The thing that keeps it all together. Super Mario and the lads in Brussels. Okay? Well, what does it do? It does boring stuff. Clears checks, issues new currency. It runs something called Target 2, which if you're a monetary nerd like me, everybody's worried about Target 2. I'll tell you all about it in a little while. They, they make discount loans to banks. Whenever so please underline that or write it down, that's their big thing. Their big thing is making discount loans to banks. Yeah? That's their big one. You, they really want to do this, like, all the time. They really want to do this all the time. Okay? Discount loans to banks. <laughs> They're up there going, I think he's looking at you. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes. Um, so... Examine bank holding companies, and now the ECB's job is to regulate the 6,000 banks in, um, in the Eurozone. It's a very, very interesting thing to do. But basically, their biggest one is evaluating and making discount loans to banks. The ECB is the reason that you can borrow cheaply from Ulster Bank and AIB and all these other ones. So now, last slide, let's look at the ECB's balance sheet. The ECB's balance sheet. Would everybody please da take down this box? This box here. This is very important. This is very important. On this side here, we have assets. Okay. Assets, government securities, and discount loans. This is the central bank. Different from private banks. The central bank. This is the ECB. With Super Mario at the head. Then we've got liabilities. Currency in circulation and reserves. Now, what's the magic thing about the central bank? The magic thing about the central bank is that it can make this number anything it wants. This number here, currency in circulation, it can make it anything it wants. You must get your head around this. It's very important. Extremely important, actually. This can be anything you want. If you want it to be two trillion, just flick a switch, it's two trillion. Make it three, it's three. Make it four, it's four. Why? Because you're the central bank, and that's what you do. You literally print money out of thin air. So if you want to give more discount loans to the banks, all you do is print off more, more bonds, make more loans, and then increase this amount. This is why you should never be worried about central bank's balance sheet. They can always print off more money. Now, we have a lot to talk about in the next lecture. But, but no, I'll leave it here. Thank you very much. And um, have a lovely day. Try not to die. You. Try not to die. <laughs>